Welcome to Lesson 14, Solving Non-Homogeneous Ordinary Differential Equations by the Annihilator Method. Let's consider an introductory example. Solve the ordinary differential equation, second derivative of y with respect to x plus four times y equals three x. Because we have three x here, this is a non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation. Well, to solve this, I'd like to have zero on this side and something else maybe on this side. So here's what I would do. I would note that if I differentiate three x with respect to x twice, in other words, take the second derivative of x take the second derivative of 3x with respect to x, we get 0. So what we'll do is apply that annihilator of this to both sides of the equation. Apply the second derivative with respect to x to both sides of this equation up here. So that's what we do down here. Second derivative of this equals the second derivative of this. Now, let's just simplify. The second derivative of this stuff is equal to the fourth derivative of y with respect to x plus four times the second derivative of y with respect to x. On the other side of the equation, we saw that this second derivative of 3x is equal to zero. So we started with a differential equation that was non-homogeneous and was of order two. And down here, we ended up with an equation that is homogeneous that has order four. Let's look at this example, continued from a couple slides ago, I guess. If y satisfies this non-homogeneous equation, then that function y of x plugged into this side is some function and this side is also a function of x. So the derivative, second derivative with respect to x of this function equals the second derivative of x with respect to this function of x. And if you take second derivatives of both sides, we get this homogeneous differential equation. So if we let a be the set of all solutions to that fourth order homogeneous equation, and if we let b be the set of all solutions to this second order non-homogeneous equation, we just saw that if y is in b, in other words, satisfies the second order differential equation, then y is in a, because it satisfies this fourth order homogeneous equation. And this statement tells us that b is a subset of a. We saw that if y satisfies this second order non-homogeneous equation, then y would satisfy this fourth order homogeneous differential equation. And we saw that if a is the set of all solutions to this non-homogeneous problem, and if we let b be the solution to the corresponding fourth order homogeneous problem, then b is a subset of a as shown here. So the solutions B of the non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation, this one, is hidden somewhere in the set A of all of the solutions. And our mission is to find the set B, the solutions to the non-homogeneous problem. Well, we can find the solutions to this homogeneous constant coefficient linear problem pretty easily by looking at the characteristic equation and finding the values of r that satisfy that and thus find the functions that satisfy this differential equation. But then it involves certain arbitrary constants and we'll have to fidget those arbitrary constants so that we get solutions to this non-homogeneous equation up here. So first, find the general solution to this fourth order homogeneous 
linear differential equation. Um, the solutions to this, remember, comprised what we called the set A over here before. The characteristic equation is r to the fourth plus 4r squared equals 0. This factors into r squared times r squared plus 4 equals 0. So r equals 0 is a double root, and r equals 2i, and the conjugate r equals minus 2i are single roots. So the general solution to this equation is going to be the following. Um, you would have C1e to the 0x plus C2xe to the 0x due to 0 being a double root. And that just simplifies to C1 plus C2x. And corresponding to plus 2i and minus 2i, those roots, we get a constant times cosine 2x plus another constant times sine 2x. So the general solution to this homogeneous equation looks like this. All of the solutions inside A look like this. Now I have to find out which ones of those are in B. Basically, we can't just pick C1, C2, C3, and C4 arbitrarily and expect the solution to be in this set B. Only particular values of C1, C2, C3, and C4 will fit the bill. So what we have here are basically C1, C2, C3, C4 are what we call undetermined coefficients. So we want to find the values of C1, C2, C3, C4 that will allow us to find the solution to this equation. So if we let y be c1 plus c2x plus c3 cosine 2x plus c4 sine 2x, then differentiate this with respect to x twice. The second derivative of y with respect to x equals what? The second derivative with respect to x of a constant is 0. The second derivative of c2x the second derivative with respect to x of this is also 0. The second derivative of c3 cosine 2x is minus 4c3 cosine 2x. And the second derivative of c4 sine 2x, using the chain rule a couple, couple of times, will give us minus 4c4 sine 2x. So now we're going to plug this thing, which is y, and this thing, which is the second derivative of y with respect to x, into the left-hand side of the ordinary differential equation. This stuff here. The second derivative of y with respect to x, we just found out, was this stuff right here. Plus 4 times y is 4 times all of this stuff. Now let's see how this simplifies. Here we have a minus 4c3 cosine 2x. Over here, we have plus 4c3 cosine 2x. Those add up to 0. We also have minus 4c4 sine 2x plus 4 times c4 sine 2x. Those two terms add up to 0. So the only thing that's going to be left is 4 times this, these two terms here. And so the second derivative of y with respect to x plus 4y is equal to this which we can multiply out to get 4c1 plus 4c2x. Uh, but we want to find a solution to this equation. This stuff equals 3x. Well, we have the same, this stuff right here. So this, we can fidget the c1 and the c2 to make this equal to 3x. We can do that pretty easily. We can let c1 be 0, and we can let c2 be 3 fourths. So we just get 0 plus 4 times 3 fourths times x, which is 3x. So here are a c1 and c2 that work. So in that case, we find a particular solution to this differential equation. We'll call it y sub p for particular, and it's 3 fourths x. This solution satisfies this equation right here. The second derivative of y sub p plus 4 times y sub p equals 3x. And we can think of this left-hand side as a linear
transformation applied to y sub p. So we have a solution to the non-homogeneous differential equation. However, this particular solution to that non-homogeneous differential equation is not the general solution. There are more solutions. How do we find them? The function y sub c, which is c sub 3 cosine 2x plus c sub 4 sine 2x, where c sub 3 and c sub 4 are arbitrary constants, this satisfies the homogeneous ordinary differential equation. The second derivative with respect to x of y sub c plus 4y sub c equals 0, which we can think of as L of y sub c equals 0. L of a function is the second derivative of that function plus 4 times that function. This y sub c that satisfies this homogeneous problem is called the complementary solution. If we take the particular solution, which was 3 fourths x, plus the complementary solution, which were these two terms, the cosine and sine terms, this is a general solution to the differential equation, the non-homogeneous differential equation, second derivative of y with respect to x plus 4y equals 3x. In that general solution, note that there were no conditions specified on c sub 3 and c sub 4, except that they were constants. y sub c, which is this function, is the general solution to the corresponding second order homogeneous problem, which is this, second derivative of y with respect to x plus 4y equals 0. What we did, basically, was we took a particular solution, this one, 3 fourths x, we added the general solution to this second order homogeneous problem, and together they gave us the solution to the entire problem by the superposition principle, basically. As we mentioned before, y sub c is the complementary solution, y sub p is called the particular solution to this non-homogeneous problem. The complementary solution satisfies this differential equation with zero on this side. The particular solution satisfies this whole non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation. So let's summarize what we did in this introductory example. We were looking at the differential equation, the derivative, second derivative of y with respect to x plus 4 times y equals 3x, non-homogeneous. I've switched the order here. The corresponding homogeneous differential equation, the same as the non-homogeneous, except you have 0 on this side. The complementary function, the solution to this corresponding homogeneous problem, was c3 cosine 2x plus c4 sine 2x. For the non-homogeneous differential equation with the 3x on this side, we found a particular solution, y sub p is 3 fourths x. Then to get the general solution to this non-homogeneous problem, we added the particular solution plus that complementary function, complementary solution, that involved arbitrary constants. So the general solution was y equals 3 fourths x plus an arbitrary constant times cosine 2x plus an arbitrary constant times sine 2x. So here is the argument in a nutshell. Let's suppose that y equals that particular solution we found before plus the complementary function. So L of y equals L of y sub p plus y sub c. Remember what L does. L of any function in this particular example is the second derivative with respect to x of that function plus 4 times this function. L is linear. So L of the sum of these two functions 
is L of the first function plus L of the second function. Now, L of y sub p equals 3x. L of y sub c, the complementary function, equals 0. And 0, 3x plus 0, is equal to 3x. So L of y for this particular function is equal to 3x. We can use SageMath software to find the solution to our differential equation. Let's use it to check the answer that we just got. Here's uh, three lines of code in one cell of SageMath. The first line, x equals ver, quote, x, quote, uh, that declares x to be a variable. Then we have y equals function, and then parentheses, quote, y, and then of x. This line defines y to be a function of x. We don't know what that function is. Uh, we're just declaring y to be some function. And we're going to use DE solve, differential equation solve, to find out what y satisfies the following differential equation. The second derivative of y with respect to x plus 4 times y minus 3 times x equals 0. Um, in DE solve, we implicitly have that this stuff equals 0. And we're solving for y. So to run this, we should click first in that cell and then hold down shift and then enter. And let's see what happens. Here's our solution. Uh, y is going to be a constant and underlying k2 is just an arbitrary constant times cosine 2x plus another arbitrary constant times sine of 2 times x plus 3 fourths times x. This is the same solution that we got from our previous calculation. So let's discuss the annihilator method in more detail. The annihilator method works for constant coefficient linear non-homogeneous ordinary differential equations like L of y equals some function f of x. f could consist of many terms. Each term of f of x consists of a product of one or more of these factors, a constant, a non-negative integer power of x, e to the alpha x for some alpha, a sine or cosine function of beta x for some constant beta. So in the annihilator method, first we will solve L of y equals 0 for the complementary function y sub c. Second, let's let d be the differentiation operator. Uh, for instance, it could be the derivative with respect to x. Find a polynomial p of d that annihilates f. Remember, we're trying to solve l of y equals f of x. So we want p of d to annihilate f. So p of d applied to f of x is going to be the zero function. Here's an example that we already saw. If f of x is 3x, then note, as we did before, that the second derivative with respect to x of 3x is the zero function. So that would tell us that we could let p of d be d squared. d is the differentiation operator. So then, in that case, what does d squared mean? d squared of a function 3x is d of d of 3x, which is the derivative with respect to x of the derivative with respect to x to 3x applied to 3x, and that would be 0. The second derivative with respect to x of 3x is 0. So what happens is when we write our polynomial of d, it looks like a polynomial in d, but we have to remember that d is not a number or a variable. It is the differentiation operator. So d squared is d of d. 
d cubed would be d of d of d, and so forth. So once we find this annihilator, then we'll solve the higher order homogeneous ordinary differential equation, p of d applied to l of y equals the zero function. Fourth, solve the higher order homogeneous differential equation, p of d, the annihilator, applied to l of y equals zero. Remember, l of y is basically going to be, uh, l of y equals zero is constant coefficient homogeneous. So some of the terms in the solution to this form the solution to the homogeneous equation l of y equals zero. Call the sum of these terms the complementary solution y sub c. Sixth, the remaining terms will tell us the form of our particular solution y sub p. Find the values of the undetermined coefficients that occur in that expression for y sub p. Find their values that make l of y sub p equal to f of x, the non-homogeneous term on the right-hand side of our differential equation. So then we have a particular solution and our complementary function. The eighth step is the general solution to l of y equals f of x is y equals the particular solution plus the uh, function y sub c. So how do we find an annihilator of a function uh, f? We can do this by using our knowledge of solutions of homogeneous ordinary differential equations via characteristic equations. Remember, we're looking at constant coefficient problems in this case. So for example, Let's ask the following question. What annihilates e to the 3x cosine 7x? Well, from our knowledge of how to solve differential equations, constant coefficient homogeneous differential equations, when would we have a solution to a differential equation that looks like this? Well, the characteristic equation of that ODE must have factors of r minus 3 plus 7i to get e to the 3x cosine 7x here, times its conjugate, r minus 3 minus 7i. If we take the product of these two, r times r is r squared. Uh, we also get uh, minus 3 times r minus another 3 times r, which gives us minus 6r. And if we multiply minus 3 plus 7i times uh, minus 3 minus 7i, that product is going to be 9 plus 49, which is 58, just the way that you multiply uh, complex numbers together. So we have an r square here. The sum of this and this gave us the minus 6 here. The product of this and this gave us the 58. So the characteristic equation uh, that looks like this. So we could let p of d then, by looking up here, be d squared minus 6d plus 58. That will annihilate e to the 3x cosine 7x. Okay, let's look at a damped harmonic oscillator with an external force. Um, it might not be damped depending on whether we have some fluid causing drag on this mass. Uh, but basically, what we're going to have is force equals ma. Uh, so m times a is the equal to the total force by Newton's law. And the forces are going to be the force due to the spring plus the force due to drag plus the external force. Okay, now let's see. Minus c times dx dt, that's the force due to drag. Um, dx dt is the velocity of that mass, and so this drag force is proportional to the velocity in the opposite direction from the velocity. Um, and the constant of proportionality basically is c here. We have a force due to the spring, and that's minus kx. Um, 
X would be how stretched or compressed the spring is, how far it is in the positive or negative direction from the equilibrium position. And so that's the force due to the spring, plus this external force. Now, just rearranging terms, we can write this in a standard form for a second order differential equation. M times the second derivative of x with respect to t plus the constant c times dx dt plus k times x equals this external force. In our problem, the mass is going to be constant, c is a constant, and k is the spring constant. So this is a constant coefficient linear second order differential equation. It is most likely non-homogeneous because we're thinking of this external force as in this problem being non-zero. So let's look at this example. A spring is attached to a wall. A ball that weighs two pounds on earth is attached to the other end of that spring. And the spring has a spring constant K of three pounds per foot. The spring is stretched one foot from its equilibrium position and released with a speed of two feet per second towards the wall. Assume there is no friction nor gravity, so there's no drag. There is additionally an external force uh, given by the external force as a function of t time is equal to three sine square root of 48 t pounds. Find x of t, the position of the end of the spring relative to the equilibrium position. Basically, x of t then is the location of the mass at time t. So, if the ball weighs two pounds and the acceleration due to gravity is 32 feet per second per second, that tells us that the mass is going to be two over 32 slugs. So the initial value problem is the following. Here we have m times the second derivative of x with respect to t. There's no drag term, so that's zero. And then plus kx is 3x equals the external force, which is 3 sine square root of 48 times t. Initially, this spring is stretched one foot. So x of zero, the position of the spring at time zero is one. The velocity is back towards the wall in the negative direction at two feet per second. So the velocity, the derivative of x with respect to t at zero is minus two, measured in feet per second. Okay, so to solve this initial value problem, the first thing we need to do is solve this differential equation. And so we need an annihilator of this right-hand side. If we can find an annihilator of sine square root of 48 times t, that will also annihilate three times the sine of square root of 48 times t. So that factor of three here doesn't affect the annihilator. So let's see, in that case, the characteristic equation would have to look something like this at, at its simplest. r minus i square root of 48 times r plus i square root of 48 equals zero. Multiply this out and we get that r squared plus 48 is zero. And so that tells us that an annihilator of sine of square root of 48 times t will be p of d is just d squared plus 48. So what we'll do is apply this annihilator, d squared plus 48, to both sides of this equation. d squared plus 48 times the left-hand side of the differential equation equals d squared plus 48 times the right-hand side. But this annihilates this, so this expression here is just equal to the zero function. So we need to solve this differential equation. d squared plus 48 times applied to this stuff equals zero. Well, if we look at this for a second, uh, I can write it uh, the following way. Let's multiply both sides of the equation by 16. 
Okay. Now over here, 16 times this stuff is just going to be d squared plus 48 applied to x. You see, 16 times 1 16th is 1, and 16 times 3x would be 48x. Uh, and so it does simplify to this. 16 times 0 is clearly 0. So what we have here is d squared plus 48 times another d squared plus 48 applied together uh, to x equals 0. So that tells us that the characteristic equation is going to be r squared plus 48 times r squared plus 48 again. Thus, it's r squared plus 48 squared equals 0. <coughs> Excuse me. So in that case, r equals plus or minus i squared of 48 are both double roots of this characteristic equation. And so how do we handle double roots in this case? Well, the solution to this equation up here, uh, due to having this characteristic equation, is going to be the following. Uh, x of t is c1 times sine square root of 48 times t, plus c2 times cosine square root of 48 times t, plus c3 times t times sine square root of 48 times t, plus c4 times t times cosine square root of 48 times t. So let's look at that solution to that higher order homogeneous ordinary differential equation. Here it is from the last slide. Um, if we look at the original second order differential equation, non-homogeneous, replace the right-hand side with zero to make it homogeneous, the solution to that would be these two terms. So the particular solution then to our non-homogeneous problem has to be from these two terms. We have to find C3 and C4 uh, so that our particular solution is a solution to the non-homogeneous differential equation, 2 30 seconds times the second derivative plus this equals 3 sine square root of 48 times t. Okay, so let's let x of p of t equal this and differentiate it once and we'll get all of this stuff. Differentiate it a second time, and we'll get all of this stuff. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, I'll let you look at that in your spare time to make sure I've differentiated correctly. And so what are we going to do then? In the original differential equation that we started with, uh, which is right here, um, we're going to substitute this stuff in for this second derivative of x with respect to t. We'll substitute x of p in for the 3x here, and then figure out what c3 and c4 have to be in order for it to equal this right-hand side. OK, on the previous slides, we saw that this is the differential equation we want to solve. Uh, the particular solution was this, the solution to this non-homogeneous problem, but we have to figure out what C3 and C4 are. Only particular values of C3 and C4 will allow this thing to be a solution to this non-homogeneous differential equation. Well, to plug this particular solution into this differential equation, we needed to find the second derivative, which we calculated here, and also x, which is right here. Substitute those into this differential equation and do some algebra. And what you'll find is that you get 2 30 seconds times the second derivative of this particular solution with respect to t plus 3 times x of p turns out to be 1 third, sorry, 1 half the square root of 3 times c3 cosine square root of 48t minus c4 sine square root of 48t, okay? And we want all of this then to equal the right-hand side of this differential equation, uh, 3 sine square root of 48t. Well, to do that, uh, we need to make c3 equal to 0 because we don't have a cosine term up here. And you'll have to let 
uh, 1 half times the square root of 3 times minus c4 equal the 3 that we have up here. So that you'll have a 3, this times this, is going to have to be 3 sine of this. So solving this for c4 is pretty easy. Uh, simplify it and you get minus 2 times the square root of 3. So the general solution to the non-homogeneous problem is going to be the following. The complementary solution, the solution to the corresponding homogeneous problem, plus that uh, particular solution that we found, which was basically C4 times T times the cosine of the square root of 48 times T. Okay, let's remember that the solution to the differential equation was an arbitrary constant C1 times the sine of this plus C2 times the cosine of this minus 2 square root of 3 times T times the cosine of this. And what we now have to do is find C1 and C2 so that the initial conditions on the position and velocity are also satisfied. That will mean we'll have to find what these constants are in this particular initial value problem. So if we first look at x of 0, we're going to get c1 times sine of 0 plus c2 times cosine of 0 minus 2 times square root of 3 times 0 times the cosine of 0. So the only non-zero thing is going to be this one. c2 cosine of 0 is just c2 times 1. And so what we then get is that x, since x of 0 has to be 1, that tells us that c2 has to be 1. Now, we had a condition on the velocity also. So here's x of t up here, these three terms. We need to differentiate this to get a formula for the velocity. If we differentiate this first term, we are going to get uh, square root of 48 c1 cosine square root of 48 times t. We use the chain rule there. When we differentiate this second term using the chain rule, we'll get minus the square root of 48 c2 sine square root of 48 times t. And then we have to differentiate uh, this one, minus the derivative of this. And now if we look at this, here we have a function of t times another function of t. So we're going to have to use the product rule on this. So we're going to get two terms, the derivative of this first factor times the second factor plus the first factor times the derivative of the second factor. When you calculate those, what you'll get is minus 2 square root of 3 cosine square root of 48 times t plus 2 square root of 3 times square root of 48 times t times sine square root of 48 times t. Now, here's x of t. What is x, x prime of t? Sorry. So what is x prime of 0? Well, I'll just substitute 0 in for all the t's up here. And you'll get square root of 48 times c1 times cosine 0 minus square root of 48 c2 sine of 0 minus 2 square root of 3 cosine 0 plus 2 square root of 3 square root of 48 times 0 sine of 0. And if you look at this, this term is 0 because of the sine of 0. Uh, this term is going to be minus 2 square root of 3 times 1. And this term over here is also 0. So what you're left with is just this uh, first term, which is minus square root of 48 times c1, since the cosine of 0 was 1, minus this term, which is minus 2 square root of 3. And x prime of 0, the initial velocity was minus 2. So this stuff has to equal minus 2. And if you do the arithmetic or algebra, whatever you want to call it, we can solve this for C1 pretty easily, and C1 is minus 2 plus 2 square root of 3 over the square root of 48. So then 
coming back up here, we know that C1 is this thing. C2 we found over here. And then we had this other term that didn't involve any constants. So substituting the values of C1 and C2 that we previously found, we get that x is equal to this. Can we algebraically simplify this solution? Well, somewhat. Here's the solution that we saw on the last uh, slide. And the square root of 48 is the square root of 16 times 3. But the square root of 16 is 4. So the square root of 48 can be written as 4 square root of 3. So that's one simplification that we can make. Replace all of these square root of 48s with 4 square root of 3s. OK, now let's look at this factor right here. OK, minus 2 plus 2 square root of 3 over 4 square root of 3. Can we simplify that? Well, let's see. Here is that quantity. Let's just break it up into two fractions. Uh, this over the denominator plus this over that denominator. Now, if we look at this first term, minus 2 fourths is minus 1 half. 1 over the square root of 3 is equal to square root of 3 divided by 3. Okay. And now, if you look at the second uh, part of this, 2 square root of 3 divided by 4 square root of 3, square root of 3's uh, are in both numerator and denominator in that case, and we'll just have as the second fraction 2 fourths, which is 1 half. So now, simplifying this, we can write this product as minus the square root of 3 over 6 plus that second term 1 half. So we can, instead of writing this fairly complex fraction, we could write it this way if we wanted to and then the rest is unchanged. Uh, but then we could multiply this factor by 6 and also divide by 6. So this factor times the sign is equal to 1 6 times this factor times that sign. And this, most people might say, is a little bit simpler than what we have up here. But they're still the same answer. They're equivalent. So now let's see what SageMath software would give us as a solution to this initial value problem that we just solved more or less by hand. Um, Here's the solution that we uh, just saw in our simplified form. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, first of all, I'm going to define a function xg. Uh, xg is going to be a function. Its name is xg. It's a function of t. OK. And now uh, I'm going to let f be the solution to the initial value problem. So f equals. And then I'm going to use DE solve, dif solve the differential equation. And here's the differential equation. 1 16th times the derivative of this function xg at t evaluated, uh, differentiated with respect to t twice. So this is a second derivative. Plus 3 times that function xg of t minus 3 times the sine of square root of 48 times t. This all equals 0. We're solving for xg, that function. And the initial conditions are xg of 0 is 1. And the first derivative of xg at 0 is minus 2. And so we're finding the solution to this 
initial value problem. That's going to be a function f. And then we'll just ask Sage to display f by just putting its name here. And what um, Sage math gives us is the following. Minus 2 square root of 3 times t times cosine 4 square root of 3 times t. Okay, and that is the term that we had right up here. Minus 1 sixth times, and then we have the square root of 3 minus uh, 3, which is about what we have here. Uh, notice we have a minus sign here, we have a plus sign here, and here we have the square root of 3 minus 3, and here we have 3 minus the square root of 3. So with that sign taken into account, those are uh, the same thing. And then it's times the sine 4 square root of 3 times t, which is what we have up here. Okay. Uh, and then we also have plus cosine 4 square root of 3 times t, which is the term that we have right here. Um, so this sage math answer is the same as our simplified answer to that initial value problem. So the solution to our initial value problem was this. Um, we have three terms. Uh, the first term is a constant times a sine function. The second term is basically a constant one times a cosine function. And then if we look at this third term, it's a little bit different. Uh, we have in this term t times the cosine of 4 square root of 3t. As t gets larger and larger, t times the cosine of this stuff will have, I guess you can say, amplitudes that get bigger and bigger. So what's going to happen? These first two terms are bounded as t goes to infinity, but this last one, this last term added or subtracted to it, is going to have amplitudes that get larger and larger as time goes on, higher and higher peaks in an, oscill in an oscillatory system. So in our example, the frequency of the external force applied to the mass was the same as the natural frequency of the system without that external force. Um, it's like when you push a uh, person on a swing. You are pushing that person periodically with the same period as the swing of the movement of the swing. Uh, because it had the same frequency, the external force adds to the amplitude as time goes on. Uh, and the amplitude of the oscillations grow without bound. We're going to look at a MATLAB program soon to analyze this function x of t. Uh, we're going to let x1 of t be the first two terms here. We'll let x sub 2 of t equal this third term. And then x of t, the solution that we see over here, is just going to be x sub 1 plus x sub 2. And we'll graph each of these uh, using MATLAB. So here is the MATLAB program. Uh, first, we clear the workspace. And then we're going to uh, calculate uh, points on some graphs. So we'll let k go from 1 to 300 increment 1. t sub k will be 0 plus 7 over 300 times k minus 1. So if you think about what this does, when k equals 1, t sub 1 is 0 plus this times 0. So t sub 1 is 0. By the time we get to 300, t sub k is going to be 0 plus 7 over 300 times 299. So that's almost going to be 0 plus 7, uh, which will be approximately 7, just slightly less than 7 for the endpoint. Uh, for each of these values of uh, time, let's say t sub k, 
we calculate x2 sub k as we saw on the previous transparency. This is the first two terms of our solution function to the initial value problem. x sub 3 of k is minus 2 times square root of 3 times t sub k times cosine of 4 times the square root of 3 times t sub k. So this basically was the 2 square root of 3 t cosine 4 square root of 3 t term that we saw before. But we're calculating various values uh, so that we can plot this uh, and storing it in an array, x sub 3. And then x sub k uh, is going to be x sub 2k, x2 sub k, plus x3 sub k. Then we're going to uh, have several figures. The first one, figure 1, will plot t versus x, t on the horizontal axis, x on the vertical axis, uh, where um, the axis uh, is x going from 0 to 7 and y going from minus 30. Let me say that again, sorry. Uh, t will go from 0 to 7, and x will go from minus 30 to 30. Figure 2 is going to be to plot t versus x sub 2, the array t versus the array x2. And we'll use the same axis, t going from 0 to 7, x2 in this case on the vertical axis going from minus 30 to 30, and we'll do the same for x3. Uh, so remember that x was equal to x2 plus x3. So we're plotting the graph of x, x2, and x3. So what do those graphs look like? Well, here's a graph of x2. If we look at x2, it's basically a constant times a sine function plus a cosine function. And so you would not be surprised that this oscillates with a certain constant amplitude. We saw before that if we have the sine of something like this and the cosine of something like this, both of these somethings being the same, these can actually be combined into one cosine function with a, an amplitude that we can calculate and a phase angle. So that's not surprising that the graph looks like this. If we look at the third term in the solution, which we called x sub 3, uh, that was minus 2 times t times cosine of this stuff, 4 square root of 3 times t. As you would imagine, uh, as t gets larger and larger, the graph oscillates more and more with bigger, higher peaks, lower trials too, I guess. Now, if we add this graph to this graph, we get the one down here. And it's very hard to see the difference between these two, except maybe right around here for very small values of t, okay? Um, because we have something that's close to zero here because of this factor of t in here, when t is close to zero. Uh, what dominates right here is this graph over here, okay? Uh, but in the long run, uh, this graph didn't make much difference to the solution because everything was overshadowed by minus 2 thirds t cosine 4 square root of 3 t. So we could have, even without looking at these graphs, with this reasoning, figured out that this was about what the graph was going to look like. So now let's talk about the phenomenon of beats. Uh, suppose we have an initial value problem. We could construct one fairly easily. Uh, and let's suppose that the solution to this initial value problem is cosine of 21 times t 
plus cosine of 23 times t. Um, maybe the first term represents the oscillations without uh, an external force. And suppose the second term comes from an external force with a certain frequency that's slightly different from the one over here, uh, but not too different. They're pretty close. Uh, if we talked about circular frequencies, like cosine of omega t, here the circular frequency omega uh, would be 21. For this one, the circular frequency omega would be 23, not the same omega necessarily. From this one, they're different numbers, aren't they? Um, and we know that frequency and circular frequency are proportional to each other. So we could get this sort of solution to an initial value problem pretty easily. OK, so if we graph this, we have this. That starts here with small oscillations. The amplitude gets bigger, then the amplitude gets smaller, then the amplitude gets bigger, and then the amplitude gets smaller, and then it gets bigger again over here. OK, if this were the graph of a sound wave, uh, what you would hear is a sine <clears throat> Excuse me. You would hear a sound of higher frequency, basically the frequency given by this part in here, uh, whose loudness varies with time. Here it would be very loud, here it would be a whisper, here it would be very loud, and so forth. And so we could ask, why does the graph of this thing look like this? Why does it have beats in here? Uh, by the way, when I was young in school, I played the clarinet, and we sometimes uh, would tune two clarinets to the same frequency by two clarinetists playing the same note. And if one frequency was just off a little bit uh, from the other, you could hear these beats, and you could adjust the clarinet to make the frequencies of both uh, closer to identical. Let's look at a MATLAB program to graph this curve, to plot this curve, and let's look at the output, the plot. So here we have uh, the program to produce this graph of beats. First, we clear the workspace of all variables and their values, and then we have a for loop. It starts here, for k equals 1 to 301, uh, it ends right here. Now, what's going to happen is when k equals 1, we'll execute these statements. That will define t sub 1, x1 sub 1, x2 sub 1, and x sub 1. Uh, t sub 1, for instance, is going to be 0 plus 7 over 300 times 1 minus 1, which is 0. So we just get 0 plus 0, which is 0. Here is a representation, a picture of the array t. In t sub 1, we store 0. We then calculate uh, a value for x1 sub 1, x2 sub 1, and x sub 1. So those will also be arrays, just like t was up here. Use your imagination. So then when k equals 2, uh, t sub 2 will equal 0 plus 7 over 300 times 1, which is 7 over 300. When k is 3, we'll have t sub 3 equals 0 plus 7 over 300 times 2, which is 14 over 300. By the time we get to t sub 301, the final value of the index k, t sub 301 will be 0 plus 7 over 300 times 300, which will be 0 plus 7, which is 7. So as this loop goes through its 301 iterations, it will produce an array t with 301 elements. It will also produce an array x1, x2, and x, all with 300 elements. What we're interested in is the graph of x versus t. And so after this loop ends, 
we'll create a figure and we'll plot t versus x. So the values in the array x are plotted against the values in the array t. On the horizontal axis, we'll have the t values going from 0 to 7. And on the vertical axis, the values of x. And so we can see that the graph is about what we said earlier. So why do we get those pulses? The function we're looking at is cosine of 21t plus cosine of 23t. And let's see if we can simplify it. What we're going to do is we're going to show that this sum of cosine uh, functions is equal at the end to 2 times cosine of 22t times cosine of t. So let's see how we can get from up here to down here. And then once we are down here, what does that do for us? So let's remember some trig identities. The cosine of a plus b is the cosine of a, cosine of b, minus sine of a, sine of b. Cosine of a minus b is cosine a, cosine b, plus sine a, sine b. If you had add these two together, cosine a plus b plus cosine a minus b, that's going to equal the sum of these right-hand sides. And notice that we have a minus this product of sines over here plus the same product of sines. Those add up to 0. So what we get is 2 cosine a cosine b, which we have right here. Okay. So let's use this line to figure out what the cosine of 21t plus cosine of 23t is. Let's think of the 21t as being a plus b. Let's think of the 23t as being a minus b. So a plus b is 21t, a minus b is 23t. If we solve these two equations for a and b, we'll find that a is 22t and b is minus t. Okay, And so that tells us that the cosine of 21t plus cosine of 23t, using what we have up here, is going to be 2 cosine of 22t times cosine of minus t. But wait a minute. The cosine is an odd function. So the cosine of minus t equals the cosine of t. So this can be simplified to 2 times cosine 22t times cosine t. And that's what we wanted to show. x of t is 2 times cosine 22t times cosine of t. So now, how does that explain how we get pulses? So let's look at the graph of x of t equals cosine 22t times cosine of t. The graph of this function is given by this oscillating blue curve that we see in here. Um, and we can see the pulses in this also. Um, if we graph x of t equals cosine of t, that's this red curve that you see. And if we also graph x of t equals minus cosine of t, that's the green curve that we see over here. And as we can see, this curve, uh, cosine 22t times cosine t, is bounded above by this red curve, uh, at least over here, bounded below by this green curve. In this region here, it's bounded above by the green curve, bounded below by the red curve. And so we could ask the following question. Why is this curve bounded above and below by plus or minus cosine of t? Um, I guess we could maybe state it this way also. Why is the graph of x of t between the minus cosine t and the cosine of t curve? Notice that in some cases it's bounded above by the cosine t, and some other places it's bounded above by minus cosine t. Why does this happen? 
Let's remember something from our calculus studies. Suppose you have three functions of a real variable x, and let's suppose that f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x, let's say on some interval i. Then, if we look at their graphs, the g of x curve, this middle one over here, is between the graphs of f of x, which is down here, and h of x, which is up here. And the interval i that I just mentioned verbally would be a range of x values corresponding to these graphs. So let's consider that pulsing function that we saw before. x of t equals cosine 22t times cosine t. Let's ask, why is the graph of x of t between the graphs of cosine t and minus cosine t? Well, let's look at the following argument. Let's pick any value for t. And in that case, uh, the cosine of 22t is going to be somewhere between minus 1 and 1. The cosine of any real value is between minus 1 and 1. Um, later, if you take complex analysis, you'll find out that this is not true if t is complex, but that's not the case here. Let's call this equation star. So case one, let's suppose that that value of t that we picked satisfies this. If cosine of t is greater than or equal to zero, then let's multiply star up here, all three parts of this, by cosine of t. And so what we get in that case uh, is minus 1 times cosine t, which is minus cosine t, is less than or equal to cosine t times 20, cosine 22t, which is what we have right here. And for the last inequality here, uh, 1 times cosine t is cosine t. Since we multiplied through by a non-negative number, the inequalities stay in the same direction as they were up here. So that's case one. Case two, what happens if for this value of t, cosine of t is less than zero? Then if you multiply this inequality up here by this negative number, cosine t, that's going to switch all of the inequalities around, reverse the inequalities. So we'll get cosine of t is less than or equal to cosine of t, cosine of 22t, is less than or equal to minus cosine of t. So notice, these two cases cover all situations. And in case one, the cosine of t, cosine of 22t, the graph of it is going to be between minus cosine t and cosine t. In the second case, we still have that cosine t times cosine 22t is between cosine t and minus cosine t. But the difference, as we saw in the graph earlier, is what the bottom and top curves are in the two cases. So in either case, the graph of x equals cosine t cosine 22t is going to be between the graphs of x equals cosine t and x equals minus cosine t for all values of t. Let's look at another example where we're going to solve an ordinary differential equation, non-homogeneous, uh, with two terms on the right-hand side. Uh, so it's going to be this problem. The second derivative of y with respect to x minus the first derivative of y with respect to x minus 2 times y of x equals 3e to the 2x plus 7e to the x. So we have two terms on this side. How can we use our annihilator method to solve this? Well, here's a sketch of the solution. First of all, if we look at this left-hand side, we can define a linear operator L by what we have over here. L of y of x is the second derivative with respect to x of y minus the first derivative of y minus 2 times y. So here's what we're going to do. 
if we look at this equation up here, we're first going to solve this stuff equals 3e e to the 2x. That'll be what we do first. And then secondly, we're going to solve this stuff equals 7e to the x. And we'll find out that by combining those two solutions, we will get solutions to this differential equation having two terms on the right-hand side. So first of all, we solve L of y1 of x equals 7 e to the x. Uh, this one, I guess, I did first by the annihilator method. Uh, we've already seen the annihilator method. It's not too hard to find the general solution in this case. And it turns out to be y1 equals an arbitrary constant k1 times e to the 2x plus an arbitrary constant k2 times e to the minus x minus 7 halves times e to the x. Okay, next thing we'll do is solve the differential equation L of y2 of x equals 3e to the 2x using the annihilator method again. And in that case, we find out that the general solution to this differential equation is y2 of x equals an arbitrary constant c1 times e to the 2x plus x e to the 2x plus an arbitrary constant times e to the minus x. If we look at these uh, two solutions, let's look at y1 first, okay? Uh, we're trying to solve this equation. A particular solution is minus 7 halves e to the x, and a solution to L of y1 equals 0, the homogeneous corresponding ODE, would be a constant times e to the 2x plus a constant times e to the minus x. Uh, similarly, down here, if we look at these two terms, c1 e to the 2x plus c2 e to the minus x, those are solutions to L of y2 equals 0. And notice, basically, those two terms are the same as we have up here. Here we have an arbitrary constant times e to the 2x, and up here we have an arbitrary constant times e to the 2x. Down here, arbitrary constant times e to the minus x. Up here, arbitrary, <coughs> excuse me, arbitrary constant times e to the minus x. So now we have found solutions to this differential equation and this differential equation. Remember that we can show easily that L is linear. It's a linear transformation. So L of y1 plus y2 is equal to L of y1 plus L of y2. Well, L of y1 is 7e to the x. L of y2 is 3e to the 2x. So L of the sum of these two functions is 7e to the x plus 3e to the 2x. Hey, but wait a minute. We wanted to get 7e to the x plus 3e to the 2x. And this function right here, y1 plus y2, stuck in here, does it. So the general solution to our equation up here is just going to be y1 plus y2. So y will set equal to y1 plus y2, and that's going to equal uh, this term, minus 7 halves e to the x, plus this term, which is x e to the x, plus this term that involves an arbitrary constant, and this term that involves an arbitrary constant. Both of these are e to the 2x type terms. And so we can combine those into an arbitrary constant b1 times e to the 2x. Similarly, we can combine k2 e to the minus x and c2 e to the minus x into a term b2 e to the minus x. And b1 and b2 here are arbitrary constants. So here's what we can say about this final general solution. These two terms, minus 7 halves e to the x plus x e to the 2x, are, is a particular solution to this equation up here. These two terms, b times e to the 2x plus b2 times e to the x, is, a, is the general solution to the homogeneous problem, this stuff equals zero instead of this stuff. So we combine 
our particular solution with the general solution to the corresponding homogeneous problem to get the general solution to this non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation. Now, in this um, lesson, we learned how to solve some non-homogeneous differential equations. Uh, we could do it if we had uh, a second order uh, linear differential equation with constant coefficients like 1, minus 1, and 2. Uh, and the right-hand side involved uh, powers of x times maybe exponentials involving x times sines or cosines of x. Uh, so this type of solution the annihilator method is confined to those types of problems. Well, in real life, you might have other types of non-homogeneous problems to solve. And so we still have quite a long way to go uh, to become more facile in solving many different types of non-homogeneous equations. But don't worry, we'll get there, at least partially there, as we go through these lessons. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I Hope you continue on to the next one. So what did we accomplish in this video? We saw how to solve some non-homogeneous ordinary differential equations by using annihilators. We applied this technique to solve some problems involving oscillators, a mass connected to a spring subject to external forces. And the forces that we looked at were periodic in this case. And we saw that if the force had the same frequency of the oscillator, the natural frequency of the oscillator, resonance occurred. And if the force had a slightly different frequency, then we can get beats. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Uh, the next one will continue the coverage of solving non-homogeneous differential equations. I would like to thank you for watching this video. I hope you have found it to be an enjoyable learning experience. If you're interested in ordinary differential equations, there are additional videos in this series covering most of the topics in an introductory course in ODEs. Have a good day.